turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, to the chapter of uh, 1 John 4. All right, picking up in verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. But this, but <clears throat> by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God had sent his Son, sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Father, um, just asking for uh, for your presence here this morning. You promised that when we gathered in your name that you would be among us. And I'm counting on that promise this morning, Lord. Um, Father, if any evil has found its way into this place, I ask that your spirit would drive it out and that this would be simply and strictly a place where you dwell, where your people are. Because where your people are is your house, is your place. So clear this building of any evil that has found its way in here. And speak to us through this message. You brought every one of us here with a purpose. Um, fulfill that purpose in our ears, open our minds, and open our hearts to hear it. And all this we ask in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So suppose that I were to ask each of you to tell me who your father is. Um, or if you deceased who he was, just who he is. Some of you probably start off with a, a physical description, especially if your father was out of the average range of some physical attributes. He was really tall, or he was kind of short, or he was, um, he was about average height, but he was built like a, a brick outhouse, and he was, yeah. After that, I'm sure, Many of you would move into what they did for a living, followed by things about them, such as hobbies, favorite sports teams, or, or their favorite kind of music. You go on to tell me how many children they had and about your relationship with them and his relationship with them and what, what kind of family he grew up in and how he managed your family and what it was like growing up as his child. You might also tell me about nice things that he did for you or your mother or, or for other people. And if I were to keep you going for a bit, because some of you are kind of not talking, but if I were to, to keep you going, I'm sure there would be an endless litany of stories and quotes that you would pull out of your Wayback Machine for me. If I were to nutshell then, all that you were trying to describe to me through those stories and statements, it would come down to two basic things. What all those stories, what all those things would be getting to would be first, that person's character, and secondly, 
what they did. Those are the two things you would relate to, their character and what they did. And of those two basic things, you would be telling me, character is by far and away the biggest thing, and, and that's what you would be trying to describe to me. E even when you tell me about what they did, it really is just a means by which to illustrate, prove, or describe their character, isn't it? In fact, I'm pretty sure that's how the conversation would go, no matter who I ask you to describe, your mother, your uh, sister, brother, um, even a public figure, what they do. Why? Why, would, why do we answer like that? Because character is the true measure of a person. Right, William? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> if you think that out, then what we can say um, that the most urgent questions that we could ask about any person would be, one, what is their character? And two, what do they do that proves their character? In the passage of Scripture before us today, it's almost as if we have asked the Apostle John what the character of God is and what he has done to prove it. Because that's what this passage tells us. John is about to tell us what the greatest attribute of God's character is and what it is that he has done to prove that it is true. And I can't think of a better source for this incredibly vital piece of information about who God is. The Apostle John actually walked with Jesus from the very first days of his earthly ministry, John saw the character of God firsthand day in and day out for almost three and a half years. I would make a very, very strong argument. There, there is no human being who has more of an insight to the character of God than the Apostle John. The only person that I would think would even come close would be Moses. But I would argue that John's experience with God was far more personal and far more extensive. Mo got 40 days up on the mountain and another 40 days, and John got three and a half years walking and talking and eating. And uh, I'm going to actually talk about that more in a bit. So, our journey this morning is to see what John tells us is the defining characteristic of God. And then what John tells us that God has done that proves that trait to be true. So we begin with, before we get there, John has some other stuff to tell us. It's, it's kind of a teaser for the end, I'll just tell you, because I, I laid this all this out, and then I'm like, man, I don't even get to that till the end. So, so John's got some other things to tell us first, and we'll start there. In 1 John 4, chapter 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, I am sad to have to say this, and I wish that it were not true. But everything you hear in a church or from another Christian is not necessarily from God. Truth. Sometimes people get out over their skis about hearing from God. People think that they see something in God's Word that is not really there. Often that is because it's what they want to see or what they wish was there. Sometimes people get a word from God that is meant just for them, and then they assume that since God told me to do or not do something, then that applies to everyone else, when actually it just applies to them. Let me give you an example. Does the Bible tell us that drinking alcoholic beverages is a sin? No, it absolutely does not. Jesus drank wine at the Last Supper and said, I'm going to drink wine with you again in heaven. If they're serving wine in heaven, alcohol is not a sin. However, the Bible does say that drunkenness is a sin. So, if I get up here and tell you let, let me go back. Um, now, for me, um, back in the day, 
I drank alcoholically. Um, very, I was good at it. And, um, and God has made it very clear to me that for me, one, even one, is wrong, is a sin. I'm opening the door. I'm turning my back on him. So for me to get up here and tell you, you can't drink because I can't or because it was bad for me is wrong. Sometimes people get a personal word. I don't want you to do this. And they just assume that that applies to everybody and it doesn't. God can have individual tailored plans for each of us and he does. So then you have people who straight up are deceived and, and they are looking to pull people to their brand of false teachings and they often are out to develop a following for themselves. There are a lot of subtleties to this and, and, and that's one of the devil's favorite tricks. He tries to recolor things that are clearly black and white in the word of God into shades of gray. It, it, as much as I have really wanted there to be some shades of gray over at various points in my life, th there just aren't any shades of gray when it comes to God. He, he's... Nor do you ever see God move off of a position. God is flawlessly consistent, especially when it comes to sin. Things are either right or they're wrong. The qualifying or quantifying of sin is purely a human thing. Purely human. Also, reclassification of sin from uh, sinful to non-sinful human behavior, that's purely human. God never does that. You don't see that anywhere in the Bible where God says one day, this is bad, and the next day, go ahead. Now, the word for spirit here in the original Greek is pneuma. And it definitely means spirit, but it also means breath and wind. And let's talk about wind. <laughs> Different winds have blown through the church across the ages since Jesus returned home. Over the years, various movements have just blown across the church. And some are of God, and some are of men, and some are of the devil himself. So over the years, there, there have been movements or, or religions that have placed varying levels of emphasis on certain portions of doctrine while de-emphasizing or ignoring other uh, parts of the Bible. In the extreme, we had the Gnostics of Peter and John's day, and in today's day we have the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. They, they have to ignore scripture to, to hold their position. But we also have more subtle movements like the prosperity gospel teachers who just want to emphasize one thing. Right now, today, there are so-called pastors who refuse, they're asked about it, and they refuse to use the word sin in their sermons, or talk about God's holiness, or his righteousness, or his sovereignty, and preach nothing but sloppy grace. And, and on the other end of the spectrum, you have preachers who talk about nothing but hellfire and damnation, and, and make following God only about keeping rules and they never talk about a personal love relationship with God. And they are all equally wrong. But how do you know the difference? That's the question. How do you know what is of God and what isn't? And John here tells us to test the spirits. Put a finger up in the wind and see if it is blowing true or if it's sending you off in a false direction. How do you do that? Your first and most powerful tool is the word of God. It's the Bible. God is, as I have said, flawlessly consistent. If anything that you are hearing directly contradicts the word of God, it is false. Period. Paragraph. End of story. That is your absolute best, and thus it should be your very first weapon against false teaching. Next, listen to the spirit of Jesus that is inside of you. If something feels off, then that should prompt you to immediately dig deep into the word of God to figure out what is going on and why it feels off to you. Sometimes you will find that you're being led astray. And if that is the case, you should run. 
get away from me. If God tells you to rebuke him on the way out the door, do that, but get away. But other times you may find that what you are hearing is simply uncomfortable because you don't want, because you don't like it. Maybe you're being convicted of sin in your own life. But you won't know until you seek God and the first and best place to find him is in his word. Another really good test is this. Where is what you are being told leading you to? Is it leading you closer to Jesus? Or is it leading you closer to the person who's telling you what you're hearing? Is their doctrine leading you to dependence on Jesus or to dependence on them and their little group of enlightened followers? This fellowship is an extension of Jesus. I am not here to make you dependent on me, but on Jesus. Need fellowship? Jesus said that, but only fellowship that is leading you deeper into a relationship with Jesus. And also, lastly, pray about it. God does not want you to be confused or lost. God is not, Yahweh is not the God of confusion. There are plenty of those out there. If you pray and ask for wisdom and discernment like Solomon, he will give it to you. Always test the spirit of what is being told to you. Be a good Berean. I've used this twice now. People know who Koreans are. Y'all all with me? Okay. All right. Heather's like, you should check on that. I'm like, all right. Well, I generally listen to her. <clears throat> Read the scriptures for yourself and lean into the spirit of Jesus that is inside of you for understanding. John's made that point a couple of times. You're not dumb. You're not stupid. You're not ignorant. You have the spirit of Christ inside of you. Lean into it. Verses 2 and 3. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is already in the world. So in John's day, talked about over the course of this book. He was writing this in response to specific heretical teaching, which was that of the Gnostics, many of whom claim that Jesus did not take on human flesh, um, that he just appeared to. He was, you know, he was a fake human. He was a spiritual imitation. They claim that the divine would never lower itself like that. He completely missed the point. <laughs> that is the point. To hold that position, they had to entirely dismiss the witness of the apostles and disciples who declared to us that Jesus came and was fully human. Now today, in our day, there are fringe groups of spiritualists and such that make those claims today, but it's not what we're usually dealing with. Either. It's not what we run into in most places out on the street. What we're usually dealing with is those who try to get us to follow a Jesus that somehow contradicts Jesus as he clearly presented himself to us by his own words and actions as recorded by the apostles. <clears throat> what John is telling us here is only follow the real Jesus. The one that they, the apostles, have testified to. So, what we're dealing with today goes back to what I mentioned in the, in the opening verses defining sin. Right now, the largest Protestant denomination in the United States, which is also one of, if not the largest Protestant denomination in the whole world, is divorcing. Splitting. And they are splitting over defining what is and what is not sinful concerning human sexuality. By extension, the God defined institution of marriage and gender identity. 
That is what they are splitting over. I read this past week an account of the religious ceremony, of a religious ceremony held in the chapel in the college where this denomination trains new pastors that first turned my stomach and enraged me, the things that were said, and then reduced me almost to tears, just complete sorrow at the really disgusting and heretical misrepresentation of who God is and who his Christ is. It's sad, it really is. And it's not just them. They are really just the latest to fall. It's happened on several other large Protestant denominations. This is happening all over the place. And very often the argument on this is that God, Jesus, Jesus, when he was here, and we're supposed to be following Jesus, right? Jesus didn't say that homosexuality is a sin. So we can do what we want. Any love is good love, right? That's what they want to tell us. To which I would argue he did mention. He did, he very clearly defined what marriage was. One man and one woman married for life. We can all go right to the passage in the Bible, it's there. Jesus said that. He did not define any other form of intimate human relationships. He only endorsed and defined one. And as such, anything else is outside of what he instituted and therefore out of his will. So if that is the only true marriage, then any sexual relationship outside of that is what? It's either fornication or adultery. It's, it's, it's there. And he most certainly and specifically said that fornication and adultery are sin. And you're like, okay, you're, you're really stretching that. You're really having to dig to get that. But you can't say that about what I'm going to say next. Jesus clearly said that he is God. And God very clearly said that such behavior was not just a sin, but an abomination to him. <clears throat> so while he may not have said it directly, while he was here on earth, did he really need to say it directly? Because he'd already said it very plainly. And Jesus didn't come to throw out the Old Testament. He came to fulfill the, the Old Testament. And the same goes for the topic of the one, abortion. There are people out there who, I cannot believe this, but people out there who claim to know Jesus who will tell you that killing infants in the womb is not a sin. Jesus clearly said that murder is a sin. What is growing inside of that womb is not a mass of cells or a cancerous growth. It is a human being fashioned in the likeness and image of God. That is a person and as such has value no matter what the circumstances are that led to that person's conception. That's what we're dealing with today, right out of the headlines. People who are trying to redefine Jesus into something that they agree with rather than the Jesus who is so clearly shown to us by the witness of the apostles and recorded in this book. Redefining Jesus is something other than how he portrayed himself, John just is telling us right here, is the very spirit of Antichrist. John said it back then, they're already here. They're already among us. They're already with us. People who want to get you to follow some made-up Jesus, not the one who is so clearly portrayed in this book. Verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The passage that we are covering has presented a kind of a huge challenge to me, because this this Sunday's passage anyway, because almost every verse here, or every couple of verses, could be lifted out and be a message all by itself, and a really good one too. There's just so much truth packed into this just little short passage. 11 verses. And, and this one's no exception. This could be preached out of um, for, for days. Verses one could be, verse one could be preached for days. Verse two and three all by itself could be preached for days. So my approach to this is to take it in context. 
while acknowledging that there's more that could be said. Right? Are you with me with that? All right. So what John is telling us here is that the Spirit of Jesus who is inside of you, if you are a true believer and follower of Jesus, will keep you from wandering off after false prophets and antichrists. That's what he's telling us in the verse. And they are trying to overcome us. They are trying to defeat the gospel. And it's not us they're after, they're after Jesus. They want to destroy Jesus, they want to destroy God. We're collateral damage. They hate us because we know God. But they are, they're, they're trying to stop us. <clears throat> because we know the truth. It's been told to us, we have believed it, and because we have believed it, we have received in ourselves the spirit of Jesus. And he cannot be overcome. We are disciples of light. Everything else is darkness. John's made. We're like walking back through his, his epistle here. Any Christ and false prophets are of the darkness. They cannot overcome the light. The light conquers it just by being there. It's not even a fight. Jesus is also the spirit of truth. Lies cannot overcome the truth. No matter how forcefully they are spoken or how often they are repeated, a lie can never make the truth not be the truth. They try to make you ignore it. They try to make you not hear it. But a lie can never make a truth not the truth. So if you're filled with light and truth, the world is filled with darkness and lies, then what in the world can possibly overcome you? And the answer is nothing. So then, if you're a thinking person, you have to ask, how is it that so many people follow Antichrist and false teachers? I mean, we wouldn't even be talking about them, really, if people didn't take after them. John would be, wouldn't have even needed to write this letter if people weren't taking after them. There is only one answer to that question. It's kind of self-evident. The Spirit of Jesus cannot be present inside of them. It's the only way. John spoke of this earlier in Chapter 2, verses 18 through 21. Little children, it is the last hour, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Family, very sadly, I have to say that there are people who will sit among us and outwardly appear to be one of us. What we are in here, family, I call you family. We're family because we're family of God, his little children, his beloved, who are sealed for eternity with the Holy Spirit. And if someone goes out, it proves, it makes manifest that they are not one of us at all. Because if they had been, they would have the Spirit of Jesus in them, and, and he would make sure that lies of the Antichrist and false prophets could not remove them from family. If you're leaning into that spirit. See, God, God is always fighting to keep us with him. He won't let you go without a fight. What he did for us through Jesus is the ultimate proof of that. Spoiler alert. If your love for him is real and true, then he is going to hold on to you with all his might and speak truth and shine light to counter what the liars tell you. Now we've seen and we've talked about that, that, that scripture tells us that we can change our minds and we can push him out, but he won't just let you go then either. You can only be fooled if you want to be fooled. You know the truth. God is in there and speaking the truth. You can only be fooled because you choose to lie. For whatever reason. And if you can ever reject the love of Jesus and walk away, especially once you have tasted it, Were you actually ever really his, and by extension, then one of us? And and I, please do not 
let this turn into an us and them and we're searching for people among us who aren't one of us. No. When they're here, we're loving on them. When they're here, we're taking care of them. When they're here, we treat them. We don't know. Until they go out, we don't know. And as long as they're here, they're family. As long as they're here, we love on them and we take care of them. This is not search out for the... the no. Uh -uh. Don't, don't let that... No. No, but sadly, we lose people from time to time. Sadly, they walk out and they never come back. And I don't mean out of this fellowship. They just walk away from God and they never come back. And our hearts should be broken for them and our hearts should be praying for them constantly. I'm not trying, John is not trying to develop an us and them kind of thing. And, and we're not dividing the church over this and looking for false. No, no. When you're in this house, we love you. Because that's what we're called to do. But you cannot be overcome by false teachings in any Christ if you are truly one of his. That's what John's saying here. Verse 5. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. So, two camps you can be in. I'm not drawing this line. Jesus did. If you are not of God, then you are by default of the world. That's the two camps. God, everybody else, the world. Since they are not of God, any Christ and false teachers are of the world. John has made that really clear throughout the passage. What really makes it, it clear what they are, the fact that they're in the world really makes it clear what they're doing to the person of Jesus. In their misrepresentations of him, they are trying to make Jesus more like the world. They're making Jesus more palatable to people who are in the world. Which tells us exactly who it is that takes after them, people who are of the world. And should we be surprised by this? No. People follow after what they are of. Birds of a feather flock together. <clears throat> but that's also a clue for us to discern them. Are they making Jesus look more like fallen man, or are they encouraging us, the fallen, to be more like the perfect Christ? Are they trying to define Jesus in terms of humanity, or trying to get you to redefine yourself in terms of Jesus? Or this, are they trying to get you to follow them, or get you to follow Jesus. I hope that I will never hear one of you say, I go to Pastor Carl Trost's church. Hear me when I say this in the right spirit. You are not my flock. Each and every one of you belongs to Jesus. I am nothing more than his appointed caregiver. I lead you as he leads me. I deeply love and care about everything each and every single one of you from the bottom of my heart. You are under my care, but not a one of you actually belongs to me. Please do not follow me one step beyond my following after Jesus. My position exists to exhort you to follow Jesus, so your ultimate allegiance is not to me, it's to him. And I, I hope you hear that in the spirit in which I mean it. I don't own you. That does not mean I don't take ownership of you probably do more than I should sometimes. But I serve you out of service to Jesus. This is what he has appointed me to do. I serve you to serve him. I love you because he loves you and I love him. And that is the way you should want it to be. There are times we will disagree. There are times We'll get out of your nerves and there are times one or two of you might get out of my nerves but when we're serving each other to serve Jesus it doesn't matter what any of us do we forgive and love because that's what Jesus did we keep going on loving each other and taking care of each other because that's what Jesus did that's the way you should want a pastor to be and 
And I say all that to say this. That is perhaps the surest way to know that you are dealing with a false teacher or an antichrist. Are they trying to add to themselves or to God? Ask this question. Are they trying to increase their following or add to the kingdom of God? Are they trying to look good or to make Jesus look awesome? People of the world want followers and sycophants and glory from the world. And it's a sure way that you can know them. Who are they pointing you to? Themselves or Jesus? Verse 6. We are of God. He who knows God hears us, and he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So how do you know God and thus be one of us? We've been acting like that. To know God, you have to know Jesus. That, that is what John has been constantly stressing to us. Know the real Jesus. As he presented himself to us through the accounts of the apostles, who are the ultimate us that John is referring to here, the apostles. If you believe the collective testimony and witness of the life of Jesus given to us by the apostles, then you know God. Because you know Jesus. Any other Jesus is made up. This is not the apostles claim this is not john's claim this is what jesus said he said i am the way the truth and the life and no one comes to the father but by me and and that same jesus gathered 11 people 12 but one was 11 people around him not to be leaders I'm struggling to find any point where jesus said you're in charge of this or you're in charge of that or you're in charge of the other thing i can't find it what he gathered around him were 11 witnesses to what he said and did. It was the last thing Jesus told him before he left the earth, Acts 1 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The last thing told them before ascending to heaven, go and be witnesses to me. Tell the whole world what I said and what I did. Witnesses testify, that's what they do. They tell us what they know to be true. And that was God's appointed method to reveal himself to the world through the testimony of his appointed witnesses. So it is their testimony which binds us together as a family. In Jesus, under God. If you believe what they told the world, then you are of us. The testimony is recorded in this book and preserved for us by God himself is the final arbiter of what is true and false. If you knew what it took to keep this book, do some research and how many times we came close, very desperately close, to never having this book. It was the hand of God it preserved it. He caused it to be written and he made sure it got through. So if you follow something other than what this book describes to you as the true Jesus, then you are in error. You can follow after any Jesus you want to. God gave you that choice. But there is only one Jesus who conquered sin and death. There is only one Jesus who rose from the dead, never to die again, and by doing that, prove that he is who he claimed to be. I'm going with him. I don't know about the rest of you. Let's go with that one. Let's go with the one who actually can rise from the dead. And that is the only Jesus that the apostles testified to. If you alter their testimony about him in any way, then you are not following the same Jesus that they did. Verse 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for God is of, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 
this is the passage that my whole introduction was setting up for. John is, as I argued in my opening, a man who has been had the most intimate relationship ever with Creator God. Ever. John has seen the living God in every imaginable scenario that this life could throw at at a person. John saw Jesus when he was being derided, and he saw Jesus when he was being celebrated and everything in between. John saw Jesus encounter every type of human, per, human being imaginable. He saw how he dealt with his own family, how he dealt, dealt with his own people, the Jews, how he dealt with outsiders, Romans, Samaritans, tax collectors. He has seen Jesus deal with both obvious sinners and the pious. He has seen him deal with the ultra rich and the dirt poor and everything in between. And when he is writing about what he knows of the incarnate God to other people, he writes with no hesitation that God is love. What he wants us to know is that God is agape. So much so, that if you don't know love, you don't know God. That's how much God is love. If you don't love other believers, then you are not even born of Him. can be. When we are born, we naturally receive the genetic traits of our parents, right? How it all works. Love is so much a trait of God that if you have not received it, then you have not been born of Him. Think about that. You might not get your parents' brown hair or blue eyes, but you get all of their basic form as a human being, right? You, you get a head and two arms and legs and lungs and eyes. Fair things work, right? You are a human because they were human and you get all the same basic parts. That's how genetic works. On a spiritual level, if you are born of God, you get a trait that is just as basic to Him, just as signature of Him as arm and legs are to a human being. And that trait is love. Love is so elemental to God it is as elemental to God as eyes and ears are to a human being. Because God is love. And that is not what the world will tell you. Think back to the garden. The devil asked Eve the question, Hath God really said, can't eat that fruit. She said, no, yeah, we, no, we're not even supposed to touch it. And the devil said, you will not surely die. What the devil said in that moment is God is lying to you. And no one who lies to you can possibly love you. That's, that's what the devil did. He accused God of not and he was right. He was right. No one who, on one level, hang on, sorry. No one who loves you will lie to you about what will and will not harm you. He was right about that. His premise was good. The problem was that he was the one doing the lying. And this is the basic argument for and against God that has been waging across time ever since. This is the basic question about God that's being debated even now. Does God love you? Is He love? Now, is that God's only trait? No. no. The Bible also clearly tells us that God is holy and that He is righteous. And, and I, I sure hope that He is, um, because if not, um, then He would not and could not be loved. They all work together. If God 
was not holy and righteous, then he would be no different than any of us. See the danger in trying to bring God down to our love? Human love is conditional and transactional. It is only because God is holy and righteous that his love can be unwavering and selfless. If God was anything else, then you couldn't depend on his love. And what good is love that you cannot depend on? It's worthless. It'll feel good for a minute, but when you need it, it's gone. Now, I told you at the opening that when you describe a person, you, you can tell what their character is, and then, or along with that, you relate stories of what they have done, which prove that that's true. So John has told us what God's character is. God is love. So what should come next with that is the proof, right? What has God done to prove that he is the epitome of love? John says God's character is love. What's his proof? Verses 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, I am 99% sure, 99% sure, that if it came down to it, I would throw myself in front of a bus to save my wife. 99% sure. That other 1% is, is the whole hesitation thing. Can you think of it fast enough, right? 99% sure. I'm equally sure I would do the same for one of my children or my grandchildren. Pretty sure. After that, it's a sliding scale. And why would I do that? Why would I even think about it? Because that's what love does. That's exactly how Jesus actually defined what real love does. In John 15, 30, 13, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friend. So there is no greater love than to sacrifice yourself to preserve the life, to ensure the wellness of another. And that's a pretty high standard. Uh, I don't know how many of my friends I would do that for. We, we would all like to think that we're that guy or gal but when it all goes down, are you going to lay across the barbed wire so someone else can crawl over you to get to safety? We'd all like to think that. The best I can say is 99%, and that's for the people I absolutely love the most. It is not so with God. He is 100% self-sacrificing 100% of the time. How do I know that? Because he did it. God became a man and took the bullet that had my name on it. And all of your names, too. In fact, he took all the bullets that were meant for us. He jumped in front of the train that was barreling down on all of us, the train that is sin. He gave up his life so that we could live. He did it. And so, it's really beyond what I'm describing. It's just the death he took for us was not the result of some misfortune or accident. You know, you think your wife accidentally steps out, and you've got to pull her back and push her out. That's an accident. What we got coming is not an accident. It's what we deserve. It's what we earn. We have all disparaged, maligned, and rebelled against God. The death he took was for crimes that we have committed against him. Adam, truth be told, the people who I would jump in front of a bus for are people who love me, right? Love me. That is at least part of why I'm pretty sure I would do it, because I love them, they, they love me. If you hate me, I really have to think about taking a bullet for you. And by the time I'm done thinking about it, it's probably too late. It's that whole hesitation thing. It's not that I'm saying I wouldn't do it. I'd have to think about it. 
And I think if we're all honest, we'd say pretty much the same thing. Why would we put ourselves out for someone who clearly dislikes or hates us? Again, um, it's because human love is conditional and transactional. And again, that is not the case with God. He did not have to take the hit. He didn't. And he didn't do it because we loved him. When he did it, we did not love him. We did not love him at all. God gave up his life to save us while we were still openly hostile or at the very least indifferent to him. So then why did he do it? Because he is love. Because that is what true love does. He did it because he is agape. The life and death of, of God in human flesh is the proof that he is love. What God did in the person of Jesus proves that what John said is true, and it also proves that what the devil said way back when and what the world has been saying about him ever since is a lie. God did not have to die to save us, but he wanted to, so he did. That's stunning. Absolutely stunning. That is what agape does, and that is who God is. Verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The word for beloved here is ab ab <clears throat> Yeah, It's agape with a toss on the end. It's a agata. <clears throat> agape toss. So it, it is the word agape with personalized. It's, it's if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God himself set this example. Remember, we keep going back to what Jesus said in his, his farewell discourse. Love one another as I have loved you. And how did God love us? He gave of himself completely. So how should we be loving each other the same way? And you're going, well, okay, I will take the bullet. I'm going 99.9% .9 now. I'm sure I'll take the bullet. Seriously, how often are we going to get asked to do that? It, it may be coming, but right now, yeah, and it would only be once, right? All right, so how many of us will actually get asked to do that? It, it's not going to be many. It's not going to be many. It does happen, but that's not what God's saying here. The more time I spend in the gospel story, the more times I read, God gave his only begotten son, the more I read that Jesus died for us, the more convinced I am that the final act is really not so much what they're talking about. Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, laid down everything to crawl into the womb of Mary, to be placed there by God the Father, so that he could be born a human being, so that he could then die for us. We cannot fathom what God laid down on our behalf. And he's going to remain in that form for eternity. Nail scarred hands, hole in his side. The Bible tells us that. Somehow God altered himself on some permanent level. I don't know about the rest of you, but I, I'm, I'm a big, I'm big on convenience. <laughs> I'm big on comfort. <laughs> Even when I was younger and I was stupidly ambitious and wanted to work and make money, it was so that I could eventually have comfort and ease. And can you imagine how comfortable the chairs are in heaven? <laughs> if God can go, 
I like the most comfortable chair ever made. Boom, there it is. Can you imagine if we need beds and chairs? Can you imagine how comfortable the beds will be in heaven? We're all going to have tables. And I'm assuming it's going to be like the Jewish thing, so there's going to be mattresses and tables. Imagine how comfortable everything is in heaven. Do you think Jesus in heaven was ever inconvenienced? If he wanted something, he spoke it, and it happened. Jesus gave up all of that to come down here. The Gnostics said, oh, God would never love her. That is the story. That's what proves the love, is God humbled himself and came down here and walked among us in flesh that he created. So in and of itself, it's not evil. We've just brought evil upon it. And he walked in among that evil. Day after day for 33 and a half years, all to get him to the point where he could die. Just so that we could live. Imagine if we in this body, Christians everywhere, were willing to inconvenience themselves and give up comfort like Jesus did for one another. This would be a much different world. People would not, people would have a lot less reason to question whether or not God is love if we lived it like Jesus did. If we even come close, I, I, I'm not saying we're going to get there, but what if we came a whole lot closer than we are? What if people looked at the church and go, that's the house where love rules. That's the house where... What if we just changed the way we came in on Sunday morning? What if we just came in here on a Sunday morning, not looking to get fed, but looking to see who we could feed? What if we came in here on Sunday morning looking to see who we could inconvenience ourselves for, who we could give of ourselves to? That's what Jesus did, and that's what he says we should do one for another. Imagine how it would change this body and how it would change the world. And I'm not disparaging anybody. This is one of the best churches I've ever been in. Truly, I feel more love from the people of this church than I've ever felt in any other body. But I think we can do more. I think we can do better. And I think we can start infecting some people outside of here. John keeps coming back to this. John keeps coming back to this because Jesus came back to it three times. Love one another as I have loved you. We can change everything. We, we've talked about we, we talked about earlier about the, the big topics of the day. It doesn't work when we go out, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. But when we go out and love them and try and win them with the good news that Jesus died for them and loves them unconditionally if they will just repent. And turn to him. That message will change the world. And the better we get it in here, the better we can do it out there. There's a reason we're coming back to this. There's a reason this is here. And there's a reason it's right before Revelation. It's right before the end. It's that important. It's that big a deal. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, um, thank you that you loved us that much. Thank you that you just gave of yourself and that you keep giving of yourself over and over and over again to each one of us. Lord, please, let us lean into that and let that love change us from the inside out. It starts in here, but it's got to go everywhere. Let that love that you are, that is inside of us. Break down the walls, break down. We've all constructed things, Lord, that, that 
we think we can't do that way, that we think we can't do that, that break down the walls, heal us where we need to be healed and correct us where we need to be corrected so that that love can push out. That is the living water that you promise to all who will come to you. The living water of your love welling up inside of us and pushing out. Lord, help us to lean into that starting right now. Let it change us individually and change us as a body, as a fellowship, and then let it go out to other churches and let it go out into the streets. Let your love bring people in the door as we tell them about your love out in the world. And all this I ask in the blessed and beautiful name of Jesus. Amen.